In the last module, we constructed the derivative to represent quantitatively the idea of a local slope. In this module, we will associate the derivative of the derivative, or second derivative, with the concept of instantaneous curvature. Knowledge of a derivative, second derivative, and even higher derivatives can be used to construct power series approximations for many functions. Evaluating concrete values of functions in decimal representation is often easier using power series than using abstract or geometric definitions. We will give an example of power series for sine and cosine and show that the power series for sine makes it convenient to calculate an approximation for pi accurate to four decimal places. We will close by coming back to the abstract idea of a power series to remind ourselves that not all plots of functions can, at all points, be well represented by series expansions. This is an example of a quadratic function. We can draw right triangles to measure finite rises and runs starting at a variety of locations. Recall from the previous module that we can measure the ratio of rise over run for an unending succession of triangles with smaller and smaller, but all the while finite, horizontal runs, anchored at their left-hand corners in the same places as these triangles. This limiting process produces a plot of the instantaneous slope or first derivative, dfdx, plotted against all locations that can serve as the anchor for the left-hand corner of the triangles. Here, as is common practice, x0, which we used previously to denote the position at which the derivative dfdx is evaluated, is written without the subscript 0. We can evaluate the rise over run for the plot of dfdx versus x to obtain its slope, also called the second derivative. For a quadratic function with only a square term and no linear term, the viewer can confirm that the derivative of the derivative is a constant. The notation d squared f dx squared is shorthand for d of df dx dx, with analogous notation for successive derivatives. In this example, the plot of f on x versus x descends from the left, passes through a nadir, and then ascends to the right. The plot appears to be cupped or curved upward. When it descends, its slope is negative. When it bottoms out through the nadir, its slope momentarily passes through zero and when it ascends to the right, its slope is positive. The plot of df dx versus x is itself ever increasing, through negative values, through zero, and then through positive values. So df dx versus x has positive slope. The positive value of the plot of d squared f dx squared evaluated at x equals zero in this example corresponds to the upward curvature of the plot of f on x versus x about that point. The value of the second derivative of a function evaluated at a point x describes the local curvature of the plot of the function. The geometric interpretation of a derivative, a second derivative, and higher derivatives can be combined into power series representations of functions convenient for arithmetic. Consider a generic function with a plot, uh, let's say, that looks like this one. Look at the point x sub e. I can try to approximate the yellow curve with a pink horizontal line at height a0. The pink line and yellow curve have similar values in the neighborhood of the pink marker at xe, but elsewhere they can deviate. I can improve the approximation by adding a slanted line with coefficient a1 to the horizontal pink line. As we look at regions to the left or right of xe, the slanted fuchsia line hugs the yellow curve more closely than the pink horizontal line. The approximate association rule for the function is read, f on x is roughly equal to a constant a0 plus a1 times the quantity x minus xe. The linear term is a1 times the quantity x minus xe instead of simply a1 times x, because we have drawn the fuchsia line so that its deviation from the pink line vanishes at precisely xe. The term a1 times x minus xe vanishes at xe. Here we add a quadratic term a2 times the square of x minus xe, again with minus xe in the parentheses, to ensure that the deviation between the lilac curve and the fuchsia curve vanishes at xe. When we move out to the left or right of xe, the lilac curve hugs the yellow curve more closely than the slanted fuchsia line, which itself hugs the yellow curve more closely than the horizontal pink line. 
as we add higher order terms having the pattern of a coefficient multiplied by a power of a binomial. Uh, here we have a3 times the third power of x minus xe with additional terms implied by the ellipses. We expect to obtain successive approximations that hug the yellow curve with increasing accuracy. This expression for f on x is called a series expansion and the value of x sub e is the reference point for the expansion, more briefly called the expansion point. What are the values of the coefficients a0, a1, a2, and so forth? Evaluate the function at the expansion point. f on x e is roughly a0 plus a1 times x e, and that's x e because it's substituting for x, minus x e plus a2 times square of the quantity x e minus x e and so forth. All those terms with x e minus itself vanish, so a0 must be the value of the function evaluated at x e. Okay, go back to the association rule at the top of the page and take its first derivative. df dx evaluated at x0 is roughly equal to um, well, there's no a0 term because differentiation makes constants disappear. We start with a1, and then we add 2 times a2 quantity x0 minus xe plus 3 times a3 times the square of x0 minus xe plus successive examples of the power rule for differentiation. Evaluating the first derivative at x sub e, all the binomials again vanish, so a1 must be the derivative of f evaluated at the expansion point x sub e. Go back to the association rule at the top of the page and again write down its derivative. Here we are abbreviating x0 as simply x. Take the derivative of that expression to obtain d squared f dx squared at x is roughly equal to 2a2 plus 3 times 2 times a3 times x minus xe, and so forth. Evaluating again at x sub e, a bunch of binomial terms vanish, so twice the coefficient a sub 2 must equal d squared f dx squared evaluated at x sub e. Similarly, we can write down again the second derivative uh, we just did that a couple steps ago. We had d squared f dx squared evaluated at x is roughly 2 times a2 and so forth, and take the derivative of this stuff to get d cubed f dx cubed evaluated at x is roughly equal to 3 times 2 times a3 plus additional terms containing binomials taken to increasing powers. Evaluating at the expansion point x e, the binomials vanish, so 3 times 2 times the coefficient a3 must equal d cubed f dx cubed evaluated at x e. The equations constraining the values of a0, a1, a2, a3 running down this page and their analogous equations in principle continuing through the bottom of the page can be summarized in the expression dkf dxk evaluated at x equals xe equals k factorial times ak. Move this up the page for more space. a sub k must equal dkf dxk divided by k factorial. Substitute this constraint for ak into the expression for f on x at the top of the page. f on x expands to a bunch of stuff. f on xe plus 1 over 1 factorial times df dx times x minus xe plus 1 over 2 factorial d squared f dx squared times the square of x minus xe and so forth with the derivatives evaluated at x equals xe. All of this stuff can be written as the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over k factorial dkf dxk at xe times x minus xe quantity taken to the kth power. This is a power series representation for f on x. As an example, we obtain the power series representations for sine and cosine. Let f on theta equals sine on theta and choose theta e equals 0 as our expansion point. The plot of sine on theta versus theta, including the neighborhood around theta e equals 0, looks like this. Before we calculate the power series explicitly, we generate some intuition about its qualitative appearance. Around theta e equals 0, the plot of sine looks like the slanted pink line. Of course, if we move beyond this immediate region, deviations become noticeable. The pink line overshoots the turquoise curve as theta increases. 
This suggests that sine on theta can be approximated at least near theta e equals zero in terms of some linear term, that's constant stuff times theta, minus more complicated corrections that bring us down from the overshooting pink line toward the correct turquoise curve. To write out the coefficients 1 over k factorial dkf dxk in the sum, we need to fill out the entries of this table. When k equals 0, we want to look at d0f d theta 0, which is simply f on theta. This is sine on theta. When k equals 1, we want d1f df theta 1, meaning we just want df d theta. In the previous module, we found that the derivative of sine was cosine. We also said that the derivative of cosine was negative sine, so the sines and cosines keep coming back to themselves as we calculate successive derivatives. You may wish to return to this slide to confirm the entries for d squared f, d theta squared, and so forth. The sine evaluated at the expansion point theta e equals zero is itself zero. You can confirm this by referring to the plot on the previous slide. Likewise, cosine evaluated at theta e equals zero is one. All of the following values of higher derivatives evaluated at our expansion point will be zero, negative one, or positive one. Here are the values for k factorial. So finally, the terms in the sum can be assembled. For example, look in the row that starts with k equals 1. Look at the last entry. The contribution to the sum is 1 over 1 factorial times theta. This is because we have 1 over k factorial, where k factorial is 1 factorial, times df d theta, where a df d theta is 1. All that multiplied by the first power of theta minus theta e, where again theta e equals 0. Please pause the video to check that the contents of the row describing k equals 3 are consistent with its final entry, negative 1 over 3 factorial, theta cubed. The terms in the column to the right are summed to provide an approximation for sine on theta. We approximate sine on theta with theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus theta to the 5th over 5 factorial minus theta to the 7th over 7 factorial and so forth with terms with alternating pluses and minuses containing odd powers of theta. This contains the linear term and initially negative corrections we originally expected while qualitatively inspecting the plot of sine on theta versus theta. The plot of cosine on theta versus theta is the same shape, except shifted horizontally so that it starts at theta sub e equals zero with the value one and then descends to the right. The viewer can verify that the power series for cosine expanded about this point contains this initial value plus one with a negative quadratic term that pulls the cosine downward with increasing theta plus higher order terms. These terms explore even powers of theta with alternating pluses and minuses. We previously used a lengthy geometric calculation to find out that pi is approximately 3.1. We will now use a power series to calculate pi to four decimal places. Sine on theta is a sum of increasing odd powers of theta divided by the factorials of the powers with alternating pluses and minuses. In the module on Euclidean geometry and trigonometry, we drew a series of right triangles to approximate pi, including this right triangle with hypotenuse of length 1, subtending an angle pi over 6, with legs of length half and root 3 over 2. Sine of pi over 6 can be evaluated by substituting pi over 6 into the power series. The sine of pi over 6 is also the length of the leg opposite the yellow label for the angle pi over 6. That length is 1 half. We know that pi is roughly 3, so pi over 6 is roughly a half. Since pi over 6 is less than 1, the higher order terms, the higher power terms, in the power series are relatively small. Pretend that all the contents in the ellipses are 0. Multiply both sides by 6, explicitly evaluate the factorials, and then move some terms around to get pi roughly equal to 3 plus pi cubed over 216 minus pi to the fifth power over 155,520. We will approximate pi through iteration. We know that pi is somewhere around 3. We can put this value of pi into the right hand side of the equation to get 3 plus pi cubed or that's 3 cubed over 216 minus pi to the fifth or that's 3 to the fifth over 155,520. 
Using a calculator or longhand arithmetic, we get 3.1234. 3.1234 can now be used as our starting guess for pi, which can be substituted into the right-hand side of the equation to obtain a sum of three terms that together equal 3.1392. Continuing three more times, the successive approximations to pi start settling down until they reach the stable value 3.1416, which is consistent to four decimal places with our mnemonic sine sine cosine sine 3.14159. When a power series is available, abstract and geometric proofs can often be replaced with simple arithmetic. Unfortunately, not all plots of functions at all locations can be successfully approximated using series expansions. Let's go back to the idea of constructing a power series. We wanted to hug the yellow curve with successively good, though they became increasingly complicated, uh, curves in pink, fuchsia, and lilac. This worked because the function is smooth looking. An alternative function whose plot contains a sharp corner would be difficult to approximate with a power series at the indicated expansion point. A sharp corner is difficult to hug with any particular curve in a power series expansion. This other function has a plot that is extremely flat near the expansion point. Because it's pink, fuchsia, lilac, and higher order curves are chosen by studying the flat region of the yellow curve around xe, the series expansion might be constructed so as to fail to approximate the rise in the yellow curve for values of x to the right of xe. We are justified in worrying about the accuracy of series expansions when working with plots that have sharp corners or regions that are, in an informal sense, too straight.